Hello, everyone. Welcome and thank you for joining us for our seventh Learn From Home Live. My name is Rose, and I am the Marketing and PR Coordinator here at Ocean Sonics, and I'm joined today by Ryan Flagg. He's the Manager of Community-Based Monitoring for Ocean Networks Canada. Hi, Ryan. Hi, Rose. Thanks for having me. We are so glad that you can join us today. And for those of you who have joined us for our previous sessions, you will know that we do regularly hold these staff learning sessions at our office. And this is where our teammates can share their expertise with the rest of our crew. Now, because many of us, and not just Ocean Sonics, are working from home, we wanted to share our learning sessions with you. So we are going to be doing these live sessions regularly. This, as I mentioned, is our seventh. So keep your eyes on our social media channels, and we're going to share all the details, such as upcoming topics and sessions on these social feeds. And of course, if you've missed any of the previous sessions, don't worry, you can find them all online. We do record all of them, and we will be recording today as well. They live on our YouTube channel, so you can visit or revisit anytime you'd like. So for everyone joining us today that's unfamiliar with Ocean Sonics, we're an ocean acoustics company, and we're based in Truro, Nova Scotia, on the east coast of Canada. And we created the IC Listen. This is a real-time smart hydrophone, and it's a tool that can be used to collect ocean sound data. And what makes it special is that this hydrophone processes the data in real time, so you can actively listen while the sensor is deployed. Now, for those of you who are interested in the ocean, you may know that World Oceans Day is coming up on June 8th. So we felt that there is no better time to learn a little bit more about what's going on under the surface. So for today's session, we're going to be looking at community-based acoustic monitoring in Canadian waters. Ryan's going to be leading today's session, and he's going to introduce us to Ocean Networks Canada and their acoustic monitoring installations and ongoing and future projects. So Ryan and his team at Ocean Networks Canada have been bringing ocean technology together with the greater Canadian community for over a decade now. Uh, Ocean Networks Canada actually has one of the first IC Listen hydrophones on a long-term deployment. So over the years, Ocean Networks Canada has expanded their monitoring program to include many long-term platforms and various sites with multiple sensors. The main deployment areas being the west coast of Canada and the Arctic. So again, thank you so much for joining us today, Ryan. Thank you. This is great. Well, can you tell us a little bit more about Ocean Networks Canada and your acoustic programming? Yeah. Should I go through the presentation now then? Uh, does that work for you, Rose? Yeah, absolutely. So for everybody uh, watching today, when Ryan finishes his presentation, we are going to have a Q&A session. So if you want to know some more detail about what we've covered today, you can just leave us a comment on any of our live feeds, and we will answer it after the presentation as best as we can. So Ryan, uh, why don't you take it away? Thanks so much. Um, so first of all, yeah, again, uh, thank you very much, Rose, and, and to the Ocean Sonics team for uh, letting me uh, present today and, and talk as part of this series. I think it's a it's a great initiative. Um, I'm going to start by talking a little bit in general about Ocean Networks Canada for those who aren't uh, familiar with us, and I'll, I'll go quickly over, uh, very quickly over some of our our major infrastructure. But then I want to spend the majority of today's uh, presentation. Um, talking through the parts that sort of excite me, and that's that really is the community-based monitoring stuff. So it's some of the initiatives that we have going across the country. And of course, I'm going to be bringing that back to uh, the acoustic side of things, uh, which has always been exciting for both you know us internally at Ocean Networks Canada and for all of our users. Um, I'd like to start these presentations off with a territorial acknowledgement um, to the First Nations, where we, uh, you know, where we work and live every day. Um, and of course, you know, I feel very lucky to uh, that I get a chance to work across the country, uh, East Coast and in the Arctic. Um, and I always like to recognize uh, where I am there as well. Uh, so to start off, Ocean Networks Canada is a not-for-profit society that's owned and operated through the University of Victoria. And we're a major science initiative uh, with uh, the Canada Foundation for Innovation, which means that we get 60% um, right now of our ongoing operating funds comes from the Canadian federal government, from CFI. And that's because we have such sort of a, a, you know, a huge infrastructure on the seafloor, which I'll be talking about a little bit. And here's uh, our vision statement. Um, and I, I just like to, to put this one up to start with too, because uh, you know, really we're looking to uh, provide leadership uh, for uh, science, society, and industry. And it's that society piece in our vision statement that sort of sets the stage for uh, the work that the learning community engagement team does and the uh, community-based monitoring team does, which I'll be talking about. So here's, a, here's the 
should be a familiar uh, map to most of, of Canada. And you can see all these spots on here where we either have active projects uh, across the country or where we're uh, looking to uh, have projects or, or install some infrastructure. Um, for all the, uh, you know, the spots you can see in the Arctic right there, uh, a lot of those are sort of hollow squares or places we have visited and we've, we've had a chance to talk to community members and, um, and, and get interest in doing projects there, but we haven't uh, done as much yet. Uh, so you can see that we're sort of heavily situated on the West Coast. We're based out of Victoria, British Columbia, uh, and our major infrastructure, which I'll talk about quickly, is um, what we're most well known for, and that's Neptune and Venus. And those are large scale observ subsea observatories on the west coast of Canada. Uh, that said, we uh, are actively working right now with the Maritime Aboriginal Peoples Council on the east coast. Uh, we've worked a lot with the Marine Institute, uh, the University of Newfoundland, um, uh, both with their Smart Bay uh, project and soon at their Holyrood station where we're going to be installing an observatory. Uh, so, just to give a, a picture, this is again a, another map uh, showing zoomed in on Vancouver Island on the west coast of uh, Canada. And uh, the little inset there picture shows uh, the Venus Observatory, uh, which was installed over 10 years ago. I think it was about 12, 13 years ago now uh, that's been collecting real time data. And so that's, about, I think it's about 30 kilometers of subsea um, fiber optic and power cable that we can connect instruments to and then get real time data back from those instruments. and and provide it for free over the internet. Uh, we also have instrumentation on the BC ferries that go regularly back and forth between Vancouver Island and the mainland. Um, and we have a number of uh, other instruments and sensors now actually on land doing things like earthquake early warning. Uh, the, the white line you can see sort of a center uh, bottom of the, um, of the map there shows the Neptune Observatory. And that's about 800 kilometers of subsea fiber optic cable. And each of those sort of orange points along there, those nodes, as we call them, uh, are places where we can plug in sort of a, a spider webbing network, if you will, of, of instruments and, and cabled instruments on the seafloor. Again, where we can collect real time data back. So the shallowest point is uh, at Folger Passage right near the west coast of Vancouver Island there. And then the deepest points get down to close to three kilometers. And this whole observatory was picked for its location because it can um, go right over the um, one if you could plate here. So we're seeing all these different earth ocean processes uh, through the various experiments we can support. Um, and there's a lot of uh, hydrophones on, on the network as well. And like I said, I won't get a lot into the hydrophones that we have on this main infrastructure, but I will mention quickly. So we, uh, you know, a lot of the work we do, we, we go out off the West coast, um, you know, on Vancouver Island on large vessels, uh, the coast guard's very supportive of us and, uh, you know, we're cable ships and we work with, uh, with them and we collect data from those, but typically we uh, work alongside uh, working class ROVs, uh, such as Ropos and, and others uh, that can dive down and, to, um, and service some of the, the seafloor uh, instrumentation that we have. So they can plug in and unplug instruments and, and bring instruments up that need to be serviced and we can put fresh ones down that have been calibrated or, or support new experiments. So we're constantly working with researchers um, and others to sort of define uh, new experiments and to find new ways to use our, our infrastructure. Um, so that, there's a picture of a, a node. Uh, so it's one, of, again, in these seafloor plug-in stations that could be anywhere, you know, two or three kilometers deep on, on the seafloor um, that's uh, delivering sort of real-time high bandwidth data back to shore. It's also powering the instruments. Uh, this is an example we like to include, uh, WALL-E, the uh, seafloor crawler. It's just one example of a remote operated vehicle that tends to live on the seafloor uh, it's tethered back to one of the nodes and it's controlled in real time uh, by researchers in Germany over the internet. Uh, we have lots of sensors, including uh, we've had hydrophones uh, around the hydrothermal vents and, you know, studying the biology and, uh, you know, and seismology and, and various fields there. Uh, we've got a whole network now of different seismic sensors on the seafloor, which we've started to use as an earthquake early warning system for the West Coast. Um, or at least a trial, uh, sorry, uh, a system. It's in the commissioning phase, I believe, right now. And finally, we uh, support some pretty interesting hydrophone systems. And I won't go into detail uh, too much on this one, though that particular frame you see there was one of the early projects I had as, a, as an engineer working for Ocean Networks Canada, where we put down an array of hydrophones on two different frames 
uh, on the entrance and exit to Vancouver Harbor so that we could track vessels uh, going in and out and, and potentially use it for tracking other things like whales and things too. So this is a bit of a, a you know a cartoon uh, showing the um, you know what the network looks like if you will. So we've got shore stations that can have various sensors on them, such as radars looking at sea surface conditions um, that supports power and internet connection down to uh, subsea platforms that might have underwater cameras. They might have uh, simple sort of temperature sensors if you will, uh, and of course hydrophones and arrays of hydrophones that can listen for vessels or um, marine mammals or, or other um, sounds, uh, profilers uh, like buoys and um, mobile assets such as gliders. We support data from those and um, of course ferries and other small vessels as well uh, going out and collecting data. So it all comes back together uh, into something that we call Oceans 2.0, which is a data management system uh, that was uh, created just for us. So um, it was one of the things that Ocean Works Canada originally got funding for was to come up with a data management sort of system that could support all of this real-time data that's coming in. So it comes from the observatories into the data center. You can access it through an online portal. All of the data is uh, freely available uh, for non-commercial use. And there's all sorts of uh, tools that you can use that are right on um, you know, our web portal that allow people to sort of interact with the data, whether it's to visualize it quickly or to be able to download the, the sets that they're interested in. Uh, and I like to include some pictures of uh, you know, myself and my colleagues here um, whenever I show this slide because there is so much data in there and it can be so complex uh, because it is always coming in and, again in real time um, for many of the systems that you know, I, I hate to think that people are trying to access the data and then sort of floundering around uh, not being able to find what they need. So. I put the pictures of people there to encourage people to get in touch with us. Um, you know, you can email myself or, or email anybody really at the, uh, the Ocean Networks Canada team, and we can help you to sort of navigate through. Uh, a few of the pictures there are from uh, members of our science team and uh, also from our two data teams. And so I will say that uh, we have a team of staff scientists, but their job really isn't to do research and, and publish on the data. That's not their main priority. It's actually to reach out to other researchers um, and to encourage them and help them to use the data. And that's something that the federal government wants to see us do sort of as a, as a not-for-profit that's being funded by them. So uh, for anybody who's interested in using the data, you know, whether you're a researcher or a community member or anything, uh, you know, reach out to us and we can help you uh, navigate that. And our data team members are constantly looking at how to support the metadata. So the background information that's needed, you know, to make sure that the data is, uh, is what it's supposed to be, and also to do uh, quality assurance and quality control on the data. So they're, they're constantly looking at it. All right, now we get to talk about some of the stuff that I that I enjoy the most in my job. Um, and really, so one of the departments and the, the department that I work for at Ocean Networks Canada is the learning and community engagement team. And there's several teams within that. And here's just some, some pictures that we put together. Mostly these are all from work that we've done up in the Canadian Arctic, where we've had a chance to meet with community members and discuss uh, some of the instrumentation that we have and to get their input on um, you know, monitoring needs that they might have for their community. Um, so I'll start by talking about our Indigenous engagement team really quickly. Um, and this is a fairly new team in the last year, but we have two people dedicated right now um, to really working with Indigenous communities and, and integrating sort of Indigenous sort of culture into uh, the types of things that we do, whether it's uh, you know, projects related to the actual data or just in how we sort of approach these communities and, and try and help them. And they've been a huge asset to myself and to the rest of uh, um, Ocean Network Canada. Uh, and one of the great things that this team does actually is directly manages what's called our Youth Science Ambassador Program. So over the last few years, uh, we've been able to get funding to hire people, uh, in typically young people, in the communities that we're working in. Uh, and they work on a part-time basis for us in the community that they are. And they work with you know, maybe other younger students in the community. They get to meet maybe with the elders in their community um, and even go out and collect some data for us and really sort of be our eyes and ears in, in the town and, and sort of boots on the ground and help to advocate for, for ocean literacy. Uh, one of the other teams is our K-12 to uh, education uh, team that we work closely with, and they're always developing new resources. Now, 
you know, all uh, the three team members on this, uh, on the K-12 uh, education team are, um, are teachers, uh, sort of by trade, if you will. And uh, so they have a, a really, really good understanding of what curriculum sort of needs to look like. And they are constantly looking at, you know, what does the provincial or territorial sort of curriculum need to support? And how can we uh, sort of inject more uh, ocean science into that uh, for K to 12 students. And so some of that is, is providing resources to the students or to the teachers so that they can um, better speak about ocean and, and ocean health. And some of it is working directly with the students themselves, either doing classroom visits, or as you can see here, we've, we've brought together some big groups of people uh, at the University of Victoria where we bring students together. And, you know, here's a picture of um, a number of students that we brought to together from across the province and from the Arctic. They were able to visit UVic and, and sort of all meet and talk about, um, yeah, ocean science at sort of that uh, uh, high school level, if you will. Uh, finally, the post-secondary education team um, within, and this is all again under learning community engagement, they are constantly sort of working with the uh, post-secondary students and developing resources for say a college or undergraduate level students uh, to be able to access our data and to be able to understand sort of ocean science. So once students get into sort of masters and PhD research and then become researchers, then they would be working more directly with our uh, staff science team. Um, but one of the, you know, the great initiatives that uh, this post-secondary team was able to uh, spearhead was the development of a instrument technology course. Um, and so really a bunch of people across Ocean Networks Canada brought together some really good content um, and created a whole, um, you know, college level sort of course. Uh, and that was delivered first up in uh, Prince Rupert in Northern BC at Coast Mountain College as part of their environmental technology program. Uh, and that gave students sort of hands-on as well as classroom and lab experience with CTDs, so conductivity, temperature, and depth sensors, hydrophones, uh, which is really important again. And that's typically one of these things where students get really excited because they're able to actually, uh, you know, all of us people tend to get more excited when we can either see or hear. Um, that tends to be more engaging than, uh, than looking at temperature graphs all day long. Uh, so, you know, the course teaches hydrophones, uh, shows how to use sort of underwater cameras and also how to sort of install and, and make sense of, of weather stations. Uh, the course was very successful and has now been sort of adjusted and reworked and reoffered uh, through the Nunavut Arctic College um, several times, as well as uh, in Iqaluit and um, through the Memorial University of Newfoundland. So now we've actually taken this course uh, and we've taken pieces out of it. So we've started with the CTDs, so with the sort of oceanographic instruments, um, or sort of water quality instruments, if you will. And we've taken that piece out of the course and turned it into a two-day course of its own that we can offer. Uh, and right now we've been going into communities and we can deliver that course as sort of a two-day course where they get university credit as, through the continuing studies program. So they get a certificate um, and, it, and it sets them up to be able to go and collect their own data. Which leads me into community-based monitoring. So this is the part again that I'm, uh, I'm particularly excited about. So really, uh, my team's role is to work with communities to find out what their needs are and to um, you know, find out how we can support them or how others that we might be connected with can support them uh, in establishing sort of a meaningful uh, monitoring program. The three main pillars of uh, you know, how we do that at Ocean Networks Canada is through what we call our community fishers program, where we um, help community members to go out and collect oceanographic data uh, so we teach them how to do that. We provide them an instrument. We provide them sort of instrument support. Uh, and then they'll go out and collect. You know, they'll typically lower instruments into the water, bring them back up, download that data onto a, a tablet, and then send that data back to us where we can make it sort of publicly available and we can do some quality control and data management with it. Um, and that's been a really excited, exciting and fast growing program. Uh, we do vessel traffic um, monitoring, so marine domain awareness. So we've uh, helping communities right now to sort of better understand vessel traffic in their area and also even to install um, what we call AIS antennas, so automatic identification systems um, antennas in areas that don't have them. We'll talk about that more later. Uh, and then community observatories. So like I've talked about a bit in the past, uh, we can sort of put subsea platforms down, uh, you know, on the ocean floor that have all sorts of instrumentation on them, cable them back to shore so that you can get real-time data access out of it. So that you can actually, you know, log in every day if you want and, and see 
uh, you know, what's going on through the camera or, or listen uh, to what the hydrophone has sent back or see the temperature of the water. Um, and the, the picture there on the right is, um, is a number of us uh, up in Cambridge Bay up in the Arctic. So here's another map, again, of Canada, but it focuses a bit more on our uh, community observatories. So you can see uh, we have one up in uh, Cambridge Bay and the sort of central Arctic there. There's one up in Gascoigne Inlet too, and that one's a little bit different. If anybody's interested in that one, I can talk about it more later, but Gascoigne Inlet isn't actually a community. Uh, it's on Devon Island, which is the largest uninhabited island in the world, um, but it's a really uh, sort of neat piece of uh, equipment up there. But for Cambridge Bay, that was our first what we call community observatory. So Neptune and Venus are these, you know, wonderful uh, big beasts of infrastructure um, that require a lot of sort of attention. And, you know, there's lots of cable there and lots of instrumentation, whereas Cambridge Bay was sort of this uh, one single platform that we put in back in 2012 that had a few instruments on it. And then each year it's sort of gotten bigger. Um, and we sort of took that concept and were able to uh, get some funding from the federal government to install similar platforms up and down the BC coast. So in Campbell River, recently China Creek, uh, Kitimat Village, uh, there's a couple sort of uh, different installations up in uh, Prince Rupert territory there. Um, and in the last uh, year and a half uh, in Burrard Inlet, so which is uh, sort of right in Vancouver Harbour, and I'll talk about that more. And you know, soon we'll be putting in one in uh, Churchill, Manitoba, in Holyrood, uh, Newfoundland, and uh, as you can see there, Hartley Bay in the Gitkap territory in uh, Northern BC as well. So lots of growth going on. So this is what the Cambridge Bay Observatory looked like at first. It was a very simple platform. This is a few of us along with the senior high school students down on the dock before it was installed. It had a camera, uh, an ice profiling instrument, uh, and a and an instrument for measuring, again, conductivity, temperature, depth, oxygen, fluorescence. Um, and then the next year, we sort of went up and installed a couple more things. And so the, the two tripods you see at the bottom was a fish tag receiver and an ocean sonics hydrophone. And uh, it was really exciting to put one of these and we put it on a separate uh, tripod about 70 meters away from the main platform. We did that to separate it a little bit uh, electrically from the main platform and, and also sort of acoustically. So hydrophones, you know, the, the ocean sonics, I see listens are very sensitive um, instruments. And so we wanted to get them away from the little bit of noise that, um, that our platform would be making, such as, you know, the little buzzing sound that the motors might make if the, um, the camera uh, is moving around. It's a pan tilt zoom camera, or there's a small motorized wiper on one of the sensors to keep the optical face clean. Uh, and there's a, uh, an ice profiling uh, instrument, uh, which is active acoustics. So it, it works basically like a very high quality uh, depth sounder looking up through the water at the, at the bottom of the ice to tell us you know, how, how deep the ice draft is. And, and we get that reading every second throughout the entire year. So we didn't want the hydrophone right next to this pinging sort of depth sounder. Uh, so we moved it a little bit away and we got some really uh, great data out of it over the years. I will say when we first installed it uh, up in Cambridge Bay, it worked really well. Um, up until I think midwinter sometime, it started to not work as well. And one of the neat things, you know, neat ways we were able to partner with Ocean Sonics at the time is at the end of the year when we could recover the instrument, we brought it back to them and they were able to look and see that, you know, the charging circuitry needed to be, I think it was a charging circuitry needed to be upgraded a little bit to be able to withstand the cold. Now Ocean Sonics had um, cold tested all their instruments, but never for a really extended period like eight months uh, at, uh, you know, minus one, minus two degrees Celsius uh, water temperatures. So after that initial year of having it in the cold water, Ocean Sonics was able to sort of upgrade their, um, you know, their internal electronics. And now you have uh, some uh, you know, wonderful equipment that is, uh, you could deploy anywhere in the, in the Arctic and, and rest assured that it's going to function well throughout the year. So that was a neat way we were able to sort of work together to, um, you know, advance um, both each other's interests. So this is now uh, closer to what the Cambridge Bay Observatory looks like. Uh, we've had all, you know, a huge number of different instruments on there over the years. And that's been because of growing science interest and growing interest uh, from community members as well. But we've continued to, uh, to keep a hydrophone on there and to listen for, could be things like vessel traffic coming into the bay. It can be uh, seals and whales. There have been um, some rare sightings in that particular location of narwhals and I think even orcas. And um, it can be traffic, it can be construction, all of these things we can hear because we're relatively close to shore. 
uh, you know, we can hear when uh, snowmobiles drive uh, over the ice you know, throughout the year uh, with the hydrophone down below. So Cambridge Bay has now been operating again since 2012. We've got a, you know, some wonderful data coming in. That, that graph at the bottom shows how, the, uh, how thick the ice gets. So those sort of green plots uh, show that the ice you know, originally was getting up to around two meters thick and how it sort of declined, at least in that location uh, in Cambridge Bay over um, the last several years down to you know, less than probably one and a half meters thick at its thickest. Um, you know, one of the exciting things too is even this year, this picture is what the platform looked like this year and us talking to some of the community members on the dock. When we talked to the Hunters and Trappers organization in the community, um, it was, you know, they, they asked whether or not the, the platform made noise and whether, you know, any of the instruments on there, such as the uh, ice profiling instrument, would scare off any of the whales or the wildlife that they sort of depend on for, uh, for food. And um, it was really nice to be able to say that we'd had, you know, a hydrophone you know, on this platform almost since the beginning. And we'd had, at one point, we put the hydrophone directly on the platform. So it picked up a lot of the acoustic noise that the platform was making. And for the other times we had the, uh, the hydrophone about 70 meters away. Uh, and so we could see how much that sound uh, attenuated and, and sort of dissipated through the, through the water column there. Uh, and so it was really comforting to be able to tell the community, look, at, at 70 meters away with an extremely sensitive instrument, we can't hear our own platform. Um, and so really, you don't have to worry about the um, you know, the instruments scaring off the whales and the wildlife. Um, but, you know, just to be careful, we also, uh, we turned off some of those um, active acoustics, at least for the summer months when we knew the, the wildlife would be around. And then we were able to turn them uh, back on just before the ice started to, to form up again. Um, so we were still able to uh, accommodate them in that way. Um, Here's just a couple quick examples of uh, how we've adapted that Cambridge Bay Observatory into some smaller observatories. These ones have less instruments and sensors on them, um, but these are some of the ones that we've put into uh, northern BC, uh, up in, say, Prince Rupert. And uh, the one on the right there doesn't include a hydrophone, but all the other ones on the left do include hydrophones. So we're collecting some neat hydrophone uh, data and acoustic data from a number of different places that either have a lot of vessel traffic or don't have any vessel, you know, or have very limited vessel traffic, but lots of whale traffic and sort of anything in between. Uh, we'll say that the, the Kitimat platform right now uh, is going to be, you know, that data is going to be uh, of great interest both to uh, the community and to others because there's a ton of sort of economic growth and development going on in the Kitimat region right now. And, and people are really interested to have sort of this baseline data that we've been collecting the last few years before all this development happens. So uh, that was talking about observatories and, uh, and I mentioned a little bit about community fishers, uh, our mobile data collection, and then the marine domain awareness piece. Uh, the map on the left there, sort of Canada shows uh, all of the sort of coastal, those little pink squares are all the uh, AIS ground stations uh, that the uh, Coast Guard uh, and, and a few others sort of operate. Uh, all along the BC coast and through the St. Lawrence and on the East coast. And you can see there's very few uh, in the Canadian Arctic. And the, the few that are there actually uh, have only been installed in the last um, few years. So um, the antenna that we installed to do a vessel traffic monitoring up in Cambridge Bay went in in 2013. And I believe it was actually the first sort of real time uh, openly accessible uh, uh, vessel traffic data uh, in the Canadian Arctic. And then shortly after Coast Guard uh, also put in one of their own antennas in Cambridge Bay and also in Resolute and Chaluit, um, and which is really good. So uh, it's starting to get more coverage up there. Um, and, you know, the picture on the right there is the eastern side of, or on sort of the top right, is the eastern side of uh, Dee Strait, just south of Cambridge Bay. And you can see all the vessels sort of going through that part of the, um, the Northwest Passage. Uh, there's different vessel tracks shown on that map. And then the, the picture at the bottom right uh, shows... Um, some of the coverage we're hoping to get with some new AIS systems that we've partnered uh, to install uh, on the western end of D Strait in, uh, in and around a town called Kugluktuk. Um, so just as an example, you know, this is how many, this is sort of the number of vessels or the vessel tracks that were going by Cambridge Bay back in 2014. There was about, there's 19 different vessels that we detected. And these are only the ones that will actually be reporting their station. So uh, military vessels are allowed to turn their uh, vessel, their AIS, um, transponders off and, um, and small vessels don't have to carry them. 
Um, though I would hope that most sailboats or small pleasure craft or anything like that going through the Arctic would uh, would bring uh, you know an AIS uh, transceiver with them so that people can keep an eye on where they're going for their own safety. So in, in 2014, we had 19 vessels sort of go you know in or past uh, Cambridge Bay area in this part of the Northwest Passage. Next year, it jumped to 28, 36, and in 2017, you can see it's up. It's already doubled in those few years. So. Um, we're, we're monitoring the data there every year, uh, and of course, the more vessels that go through there, especially larger vessels, that's going to impact the, the soundscape. So there's a, a growing interest from many researchers to, to get more uh, passive acoustic monitoring equipment, so IC listens, uh, into uh, that part of the world. And I'm going to finish by talking a little bit about just sort of integrated monitoring. So. Uh, what we've been able to do now, I think, you know, one of the, the projects that we're all excited for uh, at the moment is the uh, installation that we have and the work that we're doing with uh, the tsleil uh, First Nation in Burrard Inlet, right in Vancouver Harbour. So the, the map on the left there shows um, the eastern sort of extent of Burrard Inlet and it goes up north into what's called Indian Arm. Um, this is some of the data that we were able to sort of plot up for them from the um, CTD, uh, you know, the profile data that they collect with their uh, conductivity temperature depth sensor and us out on the boat in beautiful Burrard Inlet, um, you know, collecting some, some meaningful data. The nice thing is they've also got an observatory there. So not only is the community learning how to collect their own data, but they're also, um, they have this real-time monitoring station that's a, you know, a fixed point that's collecting data all the time. So it's, it's really nice to be able to marry these two types of data sets together to better understand the area. Um, and originally we didn't install a hydrophone there, we were going to, um, but Burrard Inlet was working, the Saibotith, sorry, First Nation was working with the Port Authority um, and now there's more interest from them in, in having a hydrophone on our observatory as well to help sort of complement that. And you know, we've been working on that over the last couple of months and then um, even before sort of all the COVID-19 stuff set in. Uh, and now there's a huge interest in getting that hydrophone on there in the very near future. So I'm hoping it'll be on in um, sort of July timeframe, we'll have a hydrophone on there and we'll be able to get some, you know, interesting acoustic data of, uh, you know, what Burrard Inlet looks like when there's all this reduced vessel traffic uh, because of uh, COVID-19. And then we'll hopefully be able to, you know, see changes after that. Um, so, you know, finally, I, I'm, I'm going to say that, uh, you know, our community fishers program is, has really been based around um, CTDs. So working again with conductivity, temperature and depth uh, measurements. So we have these instruments that go out, we teach people how to go out and collect the data. They can send the, the data wirelessly to a tablet, and then that data gets sent back to, to Ocean Networks Canada. Um, really, the next big step for us is going to be integrating um, you know, hydrophones into that same sort of app-based system so that we can make it really easy um, for community members to collect the data and for us to help manage, uh, help them to manage that data. And I'm hoping to do that in Burrard Inlet and with some of the other First Nations, like the Pachydot First Nation on the West Coast here, and really with anybody else who's interested in, because there's sort of huge interest in, 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 in getting a widespread sort of idea uh, or geographically, you know, cover a big geographic area and understand what's going on um, and, and marry that data again with uh, the stuff that we have on the, in, on the seafloor sort of in situ measurements. So that's all I was talking about today. Uh, thank you everyone, everybody for listening. Um, and uh, I hope it was interesting. And really this is just, again, this is an introduction uh, into some of the things that we're doing and, and I'm hoping that Ocean Sonics will let myself and others from Ocean Networks Canada come back and dive more into sort of the details here. Well, fantastic. Uh, thank you so much for that, Ryan. Um, I know I have lots of questions. Um, so uh, you may have, uh, some of you who are watching may have noticed me hastily jotting down notes while Ryan was chatting. Um, so if you do have a question for Ryan, you can leave it on any of our social feeds. We are monitoring them right now. So uh, if you leave a comment or a question, then we'll try and answer it live um, while we're on this session. Um, so let's start with um, one of my questions. Um, so how did you actually define community-based monitoring and why do you think it's important? And, you know, it's a great question because, um, uh, you know, it's for Ocean Networks Canada, it's been one of those things that's really evolved over the last uh, several years, right? Um, and even my role and our sort of our team of, um, you know, the community-based monitoring team has really only come around in the last 
uh, year and a half or so. Uh, so it's constantly evolving. Right now, Ocean Networks Canada has um, a few internal teams that are, are focused on external st stakeholders. So our science team, for example, works with researchers, our, uh, and so does our data team. Um, our uh, learning community engagement team is, you know, the learning teams in particular are working obviously with educational um, uh, institutions and organizations, so universities and high schools and, and, and the like. Uh, we work a lot with the federal government. And so I think the community-based monitoring team there is really to serve, you know, all of the other teams. And so it's, it's pretty broadly defined right now as society, you know, where it's not captured by one of these other sort of specific sectors. Um, and as an example, I mean, the Slaywatith in, uh, in Burrard Inlet, I mean, that's right in downtown Vancouver. So as a, you know, as far as a community is concerned, it's a huge community, right? It's one of the bigger, uh, you know, or biggest in, in Canada, uh, if you take it as being all of Vancouver. And then, you know, we've done work in places like Hartley Bay, where you've only got, you know, uh, a couple hundred uh, residents, or, you know, or, or been up to Greece Fjord in the Arctic, where you've got, you know, one or 200 people living there. And it's a very small community, uh, it can be very separated from the rest of, of society. So those are sort of the two extremes, and then you have everything in between. Um, so really, the, the focus is on, um, you know, I think the way we constrain our community-based monitoring program a bit is that we're focused on, at least on coastal waters. Um, you know, there's not much point in me doing ocean research in inland Canada, uh, again, unless it's in Hudson Bay, but, uh, you know, I'm not doing as much work in the prairies. Sorry for that. So what are some of the typical reasons or needs that communities that you work with identify as being a reason for implementing monitoring? Another good question. So it's, it's a really broad spectrum because, uh, like I've said, I mean, and I'll use Slavotith First Nation in uh, in Burrard Inlet or in Vancouver as an example where um, they have a lot of members, they're close to a big, um, you know, they're well integrated in, with, you know, the city and with the universities that are nearby with UBC and UBIC and um, Simon Fraser University. So they have access to, you know, researchers and students that want to come work for them and help them to process data. So in our, you know, in that sense, we're helping to provide um, them with some training and some understanding of what we can do and some support as far as the data management side and the, and the technical side. And from other communities, they might need a lot more support where we're actually trying to connect them um, with researchers. And, and we might go out and try and find PhD students or find researchers that can actually help them to better understand the data. But I think we always start with, what are your, the questions that your community is trying to answer? Right? Are you in? You know, are you looking at you know global climate change and how that might impact your community in the long run, or maybe it's it's you know, it's narrower than that, and, you, and you're just looking at, um, you know, what are the impacts from uh, from shipping, or what have been some of the recent impacts on, say, shellfish, you know, in your area, and you know, the food that you know, you're, you're trying to fish for or farm for, um, and then trying to answer those questions, you know, the best way we can. And you know, it's not something that Ocean Networks Canada can do, or it's you know, outside of my expertise. I, I do my best to to link them with others and other organizations. So you mentioned that um, you're always trying to find new ways to utilize your infrastructure. Um, yep. so what are some of the new ways that you've you found? How has um, how has your approach to collecting data changed since the the first deployments? Yeah, um, yeah. I, so one of the big ones I think for us, and even though this program has been going for five or six years, has been this community fishers program. So using a mobile app to be able to collect the data off of an instrument um, and then send it back into our data management system because you know traditionally or originally our, our whole data management system was set up to take in sort of data from this cabled infrastructure so stepping away from the cables um, allowed us to sort of really expand what we could support as far as instrumentation and, and, and different study types and then you know we've done more with gliders and mobile assets uh, BC ferries project has been running for quite some time now um, even just putting in, you know, small scale observatories in for communities um, is, is a big change again from the uh, initial sort of Venus and Neptune installations that were, you know, either 30 kilometers of cable or 800 kilometers of cable where those that's major undertakings. So something that's got, you know, a couple hundred meters of cable um, where we can work really with the individual needs of the community. I mean, even though it's still a cable observatory, it's, it's still a step away from uh, the norm of 10 years ago, if you want. 
Yeah, well, I suppose uh, it's not possible to install 800 kilometers or sorry, 800 meters of uh, fiber optic cable everywhere. So 800 kilometers takes a lot of funding, right? So yeah, yeah no kidding, hey. <laughs> so um, and I know that since you have um, listening and observing stations all over the place, this is going to be um, a difficult question to answer. But what do you hear most in your data? Right, and. I mean, you, you painted the picture already, it's going to change um, depending where you are. So I think one of the big reasons, as I mentioned, that uh, people are um, interested now in, say, the Burrard Inlet one, it, I mean, it's going to be vessel traffic in there. We, we do see orca whales go into Burrard Inlet in near Vancouver Harbour there, but predominantly it's going to be listening to anthropogenic sort of noise. It's going to be listening to human, you know, man-made uh, noise. So how much uh, noises the vessels making or, you know, airplanes landing or construction going on and those types of things. Um, and that's just the nature of being close to, you know, a major harbor and also being close to shore. When you look at some of our, um, you know, sites that are either further away from large communities like that or from vessel traffic or, you know, or far away from the mainland in general and on, say, the Neptune Observatory, then you can start to listen to all these deep sea sounds. And I think that's really interesting. And um, you know, I was trolling through some of the old videos uh, that Ocean Sonics had uh, had posted, and there was it was a 2013 or 14. There was a, a great one of you know a, a hydrophone that was going to be put down right by the hydrothermal vents, right, to listen to what kind of natural sound is going to be made by these vents, uh, you know, and what can we, how can we better understand these things by um, by studying the acoustics or profile of them. So it's the full gambit. Typically, I'd say people are interested in, you know, what sounds are people making? Um, and then the other big one is always is marine mammals. You know, people love marine mammals and, you know, maybe it's on the West Coast and we're trying to, you know, save the whales or maybe it's in the Arctic and they want to save the whales, but they also want to eat them. And so, they're, you know, they're just, <laughs> they're just <laughs> <That's listening laughs> So um, I, do you notice a large difference between your very northern and your more southern observing uh, stations? I think the you know some of the the big differences that I see, and I'm sure I'm biased in this, is um, this probably isn't what you're asking. You want me to talk about acoustics, but you know the big differences is obviously the environment. Um, so how you protect uh, installations up north from things like sea ice, um, the cultural differences, and the logistical challenges that come you know with working in the north. Um, right, smaller, tighter knit communities and getting to understand sort of the people there and sort of recognizing that it is a very tight-knit community and you're always coming in or typically coming in as an outsider um, and, and really um, being careful to, um, to really sort of take in the concerns of the community because they, they have a much broader reach than I think uh, some people understand. And, um, and then the southern ones, again, you, you've got more infrastructure around, you've got more sort of support around from, you know, whether it's contractors or vessels or ships and stuff like that. And, and maybe not everybody, you know, everybody's so busy in their sort of day-to-day -day life in Vancouver. How many people actually know that we have a, you know, underwater installation right there? Um, so those are sort of some of the big differences, I think, is the, the cultural differences as well as the, you know, logistical challenges of working in either of those locations. Um, I think acoustically, you know, when we're working up north, yeah, there's this intense sort of interest in um, what impacts um, climate change is bringing. Um, because as the ice thins, right, more vessels can get through and that's and that's impacting. Um, it's going to open up sort of exploration up there. There was a really neat, um, I, and I don't know all the details, I wish I did, but um, a really neat sort of uh, trial uh, years ago between uh, the community of Clyde River and sort of a major sort of exploration company and Clyde River being the small town sort of took them in the end to the Supreme Court of Canada because they hadn't done sort of proper engagement and and they didn't want to um, they were against all this sort of seismic exploration at the time in that area because uh, it would have potentially sort of huge impacts on their on their livelihoods there too so it was really neat this kind of David and Goliath type story but because it went all the way to the Supreme Court of Canada you have this uh, it helped to sort of set precedent for how do organizations and companies and, and the like engage with um, you know indigenous people across Canada and and it made I think everybody in the Arctic acutely aware of the type of sort of um, uh, you know acoustic 
Im, the impacts that um, active acoustics can have. Uh, and so it's made a lot more people interested in having passive acoustic monitoring to actually know what's going on. And so uh, I've, I've seen that a lot and that's a big difference maybe between the North and the South. Well, I mean, just um, just trying to work in the Arctic environmentally, it's so challenging. It's, it can be, um, well, as you mentioned, our, our first long-term deployment of the IC listen up there. I mean. So eight months in frigid water is going to be trying and very testing for any instrument. So we've had some instruments, you sticking with it. <laughs> we've had some instruments that only lasted two days, right? Which was very frustrating. So, um, <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, you know, and one of the challenges, of course, is once the ice is sort of set in, there's no, you know, realistic way uh, to recover those instruments, right? So in the open ocean here or on the West Coast, if something fails, we can sort of get to it. We might have to work around the weather a little bit, but. Uh, there's no way that we're going to chainsaw, you know, through two meters of sea ice, you know, right next to a community where they want to drive over that ice and everything like that. And there's snowmobiles and trucks and stuff like that, just so we can get to uh, an observatory or instruments that's not working. So it's put a really high demand on us and on instrument manufacturers to do a good job before we put something in the north up there, because once it's in, we're probably not getting it back for at least a year. I guess this leads um, quite well into my next question. On one of your um, last slides, um, you showed the the difference in vessel traffic since um, I think it was 2014. Between 2014 and 17, I think I had on there. Yeah. Yeah, and how it had doubled. And can you speculate why there's such a huge increase in vessel traffic? I, you know, honestly, I think we're seeing um, a longer open ice um, sort of season, right? So you've got this this period of time between uh, freeze up and break up, um, uh, you know, or break up and freeze up, um, you know, where there's no or little sea ice. And as that gets longer, as sort of the, the, you know, the sea ice deteriorates and, and goes away up in the, in the north, um, you're getting sort of more access up there. So you got more vessels going through. I mean, the communities are, are always in need of sort of supplies and everything like that. So it's um, it's a luxury for them to be able to get say, potentially more than one barge sometimes a year with supplies, but um, you're getting cruise ships that can now make it through there. We've seen some examples of some major cruise ships that have been able to make it through the Northwest Passage. Uh, you're gonna get more sort of sailboats and, and you know private vessels that are gonna be able to get through. So it's really, I think it's because the, you know, the opening up of the ice in the Northwest Passage it's going to become a more sort of economical way for people to go and for um, in place for the um, shipping traffic to go through. So, yeah, I, I'm going to be intensely interested to see. There's there's other players out there that we're working with, uh, like uh, NTI, the Nunavut Tungavut Incorporated, who's doing some great work in monitoring throughout the north to get a better understanding of how vessel traffic is sort of changing and stuff. But uh, yeah, I think that's the predominant reason. Yeah, well, if it's easier to access, you can only assume. So um, I do have a, another question about vessel traffic. Yeah. Uh, but since this pandemic began and traffic has significantly decreased, um, have you noticed any change in your data that you're receiving? And, you know, uh, not not yet. And But that's the question on everybody's mind right now. So I, it'll be really neat to see that, I think, in the next month or two. I know, um, and actually, I shouldn't speak out of turn. I... Um, because I know our science team, uh, Richard Dewey, head of our sort of science department uh, and others have been working with researchers, I believe from your neck of the woods on the East coast of Canada, who have taken a really close look at some of our data. Um, and I believe, you know, we're pulling together some of the vessel traffic um, data right now, just initially to see what are the differences in the last couple months compared to a couple months, you know, the same couple months last year. Um, and so that's a project we're sort of working on right now so i'll bet you in the next i don't know two three months you're going to see a lot of uh you know interesting work that's that's put out both on vessel traffic changes and of course the acoustic impacts of all of that well if you'd like to come back in a couple of months and give us an update we'd love to have I'll, you i'll find someone smarter than me to give that presentation that would be uh be great but yeah I, we'd love to so i do have one final question for you um and you touched on this earlier but what do you want to see in the coming months, years for your acoustic programming? Yeah, I think I'm excited to try and um, better develop ONC's ability, Ocean Networks Canada's ability to, to integrate sort of, um, or to pull in hydrophone data that's been collected, you know, not just from the cabled observatories, but from, um, you know, whether it's from buoys or from, um, 
you know, spot samples where someone can lower it off a vessel. And so we've, you know, with our own um, specialists uh, in the Ocean Networks Canada and with others and with working with people um, on your team, Rose, you know, we've been able to, I think, come up with some good ways to, to meaningfully collect that data. But now we just, I really want to see us be able to sort out how do we properly transfer and capture that data and manage it at the back end so that we can support communities, both the research communities and then sort of local smaller communities um, in sort of understanding and using that data. So that's that's the big next step that I'm, I'm really excited for because I think it'll really complement all the work that we're doing. So before we begin to wrap things up, um, you did mention that people can be in touch with the um, Ocean Networks Canada team about accessing and navigating data. How does that uh, go about doing that? Um, well, you can send them my email if you want, Rose, but yeah, uh, you can go right on the Ocean Networks Canada website. Um, you can dig up contacts. I think there, there should be a general sort of email there. So it's just oceannetworks.ca. Um, my own email is uh, rm, as in Ryan Michael, flag with two Gs, and at oceannetworks.ca. And if you email that, then I'll very least point you in the right direction. Um, so if it's community-based monitoring, it'll be my myself and my team that will help you. But uh, you know, if you're a researcher and you want to use our data or um, you know anything like that, I'll, I'll make sure to to get you to the right person. Well, fantastic. Um, those are all the questions that we have for now. And Ryan, again, thank you so much. So if there's a question that you didn't get to ask, Ryan did just give you his contact details. Um, or if there's a topic that you would like to see covered during our web series, you can contact me. Um, you can send Ocean Sonics a message and I'll connect you with the right person. Or you can always drop us a line on our social media channels. Um, you can find Ryan and Ocean Networks Canada through their website, as Ryan mentioned, oceannetworks.ca, or on their social media channels. Um, if you'd like to revisit this presentation, it will be available on YouTube, and I will share the link through the Ocean Sonics uh, media accounts. Um, and I'll also include some links to the Ocean Networks Canada Observatory. So if you want to check out some of that um, real-time data that Ryan had mentioned, you, all you have to do is follow the links and you'll take your break to the pages. So again, thank you so much for joining us today. And hopefully we'll see you next week when Emma and Jillian are back for an in-depth session on SEL and SPL measurements, how and why we calculate and collect underwater noise in industrial settings. So hopefully we'll see you then. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Rose. Thanks, Ryan.